So far we've seen partial derivatives and directional derivatives, and in there's the word derivative. But we also had an example where we were able to compute partial derivatives at a place where the function was not even continuous. In this lecture, we're going to look more carefully at the concept of differentiability for a scalar valued function of multiple variables. I may have given you a working definition, like a function is differentiable when it has a nice tangent plane. Let me now explain what I mean by that concept of a nice tangent plane. In single variable calculus, a function is differentiable at a point a in its domain if it has a tangent slope. So when we take the limit of a difference quotient, it exists and equals a number that we say is the slope of the line tangent to the graph y equals f of x at that point. So differentiability goes hand in hand with having a tangent line. The equation of the tangent line is then y equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. What's so nice about tangent lines is that it can be very hard to plug into a general function f of x. If x is not linear, if it's something like cosine of x squared plus, na plus natural log of x, it's very hard to just plug into that, but it's always easy to plug into the equation of a line. So if I want to estimate the value of f near a, so I want to go to this blue curve and say what f of a plus a little bit is, that might be hard to compute by hand, but it's not hard if I estimate the function using the tangent line. So it's easy to take the equation of the tangent line and compute f of a plus f prime of a times a plus a little bit minus a. So near the point x equals a, we estimate our function with the tangent line. It's a similar story for functions of the form z as a function of x and y. What we are interested in is writing down the equation of a plane which is tangent to the graph of the surface, the surface defined by z equals f of x and y, at some point of the form a comma b comma f of a and b. If our function is differentiable, then I can estimate the function f near this point by plugging into the tangent plane equation. So last time we saw our tangent plane equation looked like z equals f of a and b plus the gradient of f at a and b dot x minus a, y minus b. There's a little problem here, and that is that the gradient of this function can exist even if the function is not continuous. We could have a rip in our function, like we saw in that lecture on limits and continuity, and still be able to compute df dx and df dy. If our function is not nice and differentiable, then this tangent plane is not going to be a good approximation. So this is the issue with functions of multiple variables. While there's no such thing as f prime of a if f is not differentiable at a, there may be such a thing as the gradient of f at a point where the function is not differentiable. So it's not enough to be able to write down this tangent plane equation. We need to check that the plane equation is actually good. In other words, it approximates our function closely near this point. The rest of this lecture is going to be somewhat heavy in notation, but keep in mind that what we're looking at are functions of the form z equals f of x and y, which we can generally visualize. They're usually surfaces in R3. Or perhaps we're looking at functions of the form w equals f of x, y, and z, which we can't visualize but it's not too many variables. The general expression would be the n plus one coordinate. So this is just a scalar, is a function of n inputs. I will write the coordinates x1 through xn, these inputs that we're plugging into the function as vector x for shorthand. The first order approximation or linearization L to the function f at some point a in its domain is l of x, where again this is n inputs, equals f evaluated at the point plus the gradient of f evaluated at the point dot the difference vector where we take the coordinates of x 
the n inputs, and subtract off the coordinates of the known point. This is exactly the tangent plane equation. In fact, it's a tangent line equation too. So let me give you a few special cases. For example, if we're looking at y equals f of x, this would be l of x equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And that's exactly the familiar tangent line equation. If we're looking at z equals f of x and y, then this is the tangent plane equation. L of x and y equals f evaluated at, let me call it a and b, plus the gradient of f at a and b, dot the vector x minus a, y minus b. To go up in dimension one more time, if we're looking at w equals f of x, y, and z, this would be L of x, y, and z is f evaluated at, let me call it a, b, c, that would be our known point in the domain R3, plus the gradient of f evaluated at that point, dot the difference vector x minus a, y minus b, z minus c. And from this, you could write down the equation for a scalar valued function of four variables. Anytime the gradient of f exists, we can write down the linearization to our function at, at the point in question. However, if f is a function of multiple inputs, the ability to write down these equations does not give us that f is differentiable. Because again, your partial derivatives can exist at a certain point, even if the function is not well behaved at that point. So here's the idea of differentiability. I will express it this way, and then I will give you an alternative notation. We say that such a function f is differentiable at a point in its domain if the limit as we approach that point in the domain of f of x minus l of x divided by the length of the vector x minus a exists, in fact, it goes to zero. So this is a limit of a ratio. Notice the denominator goes to zero by default. This has nothing to do with f or l. The denominator is just a statement about vector arithmetic. So a is a fixed point, x is approaching a, therefore x minus a is approaching the zero vector, so its magnitude is going to zero. So the denominator of this ratio always goes to zero. That means that if the limit of the overall ratio goes to zero, then the numerator must go to zero, and it must go to zero effectively. Speaking casually here, it has to go to zero faster than the denominator in order to drive the overall quotient to zero. But if the numerator goes to zero, that means that f of x is approximately l of x near the point a. In other words, our linearization is a good one. This is a good approximation to the function near a. That's the notion of differentiability. A function is differentiable if we can write down a good first order approximation one which makes the limit of this ratio go to zero. I like this expression because I think it's very clean. We're comparing the function to its linearization, and we're measuring how good the linearization is by setting up this ratio where the denominator always goes to zero. So let me rewrite that up here. This is our notion of differentiability. This definition I've written on the lower half of this slide looks like a lot more at first, but it's actually saying the same thing. And although it seems like a lot of notation, it might be easier for you to work with. So let me talk you through what this notation is saying. We're looking at a scalar valued function of n inputs, and we're investigating whether or not that function is differentiable at a. So let delta x n plus one be f of a plus a little bit minus f of a. This is a change in outputs. Our function is differentiable at the point a if that change in outputs can be written in a special form. It can be written as the gradient of f at a dot the little change that we make when we move away from a up here. 
So this is the change in inputs. Plus, and then this quantity we usually think of as a remainder. So it's some multiple of delta x1 plus some multiple of delta x2 all the way through some multiple of delta xn. You can factor that as a dot product, which is what I've written here. So this whole expression is like a little remainder. And what we want is that as our change in input shrinks to zero, in other words, as we approach A in the domain, that remainder has got to go to zero. I'm going to work through an example now of proving that a function is differentiable using both of these approaches. Again, they're saying the same thing, that F is really well approximated by its linearization. Here you can see how the linearization is being built into this change in outputs. So I'm going to take the same function and I'm going to prove it's differentiable using both of these techniques one at a time. I think once we actually have a scalar value function of two variables so that we're not working with this general expression here, it'll be clear how to proceed. Okay, so the function we're going to work with is f of x and y is x squared plus 3y. And the point where we're interested in differentiability is negative 1, 2. So this point is what we've been calling a. We're going to prove this function is differentiable at this point using the first description, meaning that limit of the ratio. We have f of x and y, but we need the linearization. So first off, let's compute l of x and y. l of x and y will be f at negative 1, 2, plus the gradient of f at negative 1, 2, dot x minus negative 1, y minus 2. Now we can simplify. So f at negative 1, 2, let's just plug into that. That's going to be negative 1 squared plus 6. Now I need to compute the gradient. That's not too hard here. So that's 2x comma 3. We need to evaluate that at the point negative 1, 2. So I'll say it's 2 times negative 1 comma 3. So that's our gradient evaluated at the point negative 1, 2. And then dotted with x plus 1, y minus 2. Let's simplify this. That will be 7 plus negative 2 times x plus negative 2 times 1 plus 3 times y plus 3 times negative 2. Okay, I'll just write it to the right here. After simplification, that's going to be 7 minus 2 is 5 minus 6 is negative 1 minus 2x plus 3y. Now let's compute the numerator of that ratio. So we are trying to compute the difference between f of x and y and its linearization. Right, we want those two quantities to be very close to each other at the point negative 1, 2. So we've got to compute their difference and we're going to get f of x and y minus l of x and y is equal to x squared plus 3y minus what we just computed, negative 1 minus 2x plus 3y. The three y's cancel, and we're left with x squared plus 2x plus 1, which actually factors into x plus 1 squared. When we set up our limit, that will be the numerator. The denominator has nothing to do with the function or the linearization. Here we're just looking to measure the distance between a point in the domain and our fixed point negative 1, 2. So that's going to be the square root of x minus negative 1 squared, so x plus 1 squared, plus y minus 2 squared. When we write down the limit, that's going to be the denominator. Okay, we've computed our numerator and we simplified it as much as we could. We've computed our denominator, so now we're ready to set up this ratio and compute the limit as x and y approaches negative 1, 2, of f of x and y minus its linearization at the point negative 1, 2, divided by the distance between x, y, and the point negative 1, 2. So in our limit, I've gone ahead and plugged in the numerator and denominator that we just computed. Looking at this, this is an indeterminate form because the numerator goes to 0 and the denominator goes to 0. But we don't have 
L'Hopital's rule for two variables or something like that. Let me show you how we're going to do this. Near the point, but not at the point, negative one, two, the numerator and denominator are both non-negative. So we can say zero is less than or equal to this ratio. I've bound our ratio on the left. So this ratio is greater than or equal to zero. It can't be negative. Now let me provide a bigger expression. I'm going to take our numerator and just add to it. I'm gonna add something which is not negative. Namely, I'm gonna add the quantity y minus two squared. So the ratio we're interested in is less than or equal to x plus one squared plus y minus two squared where I just thought to add that into the numerator because it looks so much like the denominator. However, this can now simplify because the numerator is the denominator squared. So this quantity equals the square root of x plus one squared plus y minus two squared. Now we can apply the squeeze theorem. We're going to squeeze the ratio we're interested in between zero, which goes to zero regardless, that's just zero, and the square root function on the right. So since the limit as x and y approach negative one, two of the quantity zero goes to zero, and the limit as x and y approach negative one, two of the square root expression goes to zero, and there you can just plug in, that's a continuous expression, there's nothing undefined here. The limit of the quotient that we're interested in also goes to zero by the squeeze theorem. And since that limit goes to zero, f is differentiable at that point. If you're looking at this and you're thinking, I would not have thought to use the squeeze theorem in that way, you can also use polar coordinates to prove that this limit goes to zero. You're not approaching the origin, so you need to use polar coordinates centered at the point negative one, two. So the polar coordinates centered at negative one, two have the form x equals negative one plus r cosine theta and y equals two plus r sine theta. And then as you let r go to zero, x and y go to negative one, two. When you plug those in, you'll see that all these plus ones and minus twos simplify greatly so that it's a pretty basic polar calculation. Okay, so we proved that this function was differentiable at negative one, two using the first description of differentiability. We're going to do the exact same calculation, same function, same point, but using the second description of differentiability. So this one is harder to read at first, I think, compared to this quotient up here, but it can be more straightforward to work with. So let me stay on this slide for a second and mention how the notation will work for our function z equals f of x and y. So delta x n plus one is gonna be delta z. A is the point negative one, two, and we're gonna perturb it by delta x delta y. Those are quantities we leave in that form. So we don't say what delta x and delta y are because the idea is we wanna be general. We wanna allow ourselves to be anywhere near the point negative one, two. So we'll have delta z equals f of, and then we'll plug into f, negative one, two plus delta x delta y, and then minus f of negative one, two. That's delta z, that's just pure plain old change in outputs. We wanna show that delta z can be written in this form. So we'll compute the gradient at negative one, two. We really already did that in our first calculation. We'll dot it with the expression delta x delta y. And then we'll figure out what the remainder is and show that it has this form where these coefficients that get multiplied with delta x and delta y go to zero as we approach a in the domain. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do is compute the gradient of f at the point in question, negative one, two, dotted with the expression delta x, delta y. Then we'll compute delta z, that's our change in outputs. And then we'll show that that change in outputs can be written in this way. Okay, so first, what is the gradient of f at the point dotted with the expression delta x delta y? So the gradient of f we've already computed, but let me just do it again. That would be two times the x coordinate. So that's partial derivative of f with respect to x, but we're gonna evaluate that at negative one. And then the partial derivative of f with respect to y is three. 
So this expression is just negative 2 times delta x plus 3 times delta y. That's it, right? So it's actually not that bad when you actually do it. Now let's compute our change in outputs delta z. That's going to be f of negative 1, 2 plus delta x delta y minus f evaluated at negative 1, 2. For the first expression, what we're really plugging into the function is negative 1 plus delta x, 2 plus delta y. Let's go ahead and evaluate f at negative 1, 2 for that second output. We've already done that. That's 7. Okay, now f is take the first input, square it, add 3 times the second. So for our first set of inputs, that's going to be negative 1 plus delta x squared plus 3 times the quantity 2 plus delta y. Okay, then minus 7. Okay, let's square that first term. That's going to be 1 minus 2 delta x plus delta x squared. I'm actually going to write delta x delta x. And then plus 6 plus 3 delta y. And then minus 7. 1 plus 6 minus 7, cancel. So we're left with negative 2 delta x plus 3 delta y plus delta x delta x. I'm going to go to a new slide to finish this, but I just want to go ahead and call your attention to the fact that we see our first calculation right here. And that's what we want. We wanted to be able to say that delta z could be written as the gradient of f at the point dotted delta x delta y, and that's the expression that I highlighted, plus some remainder. So here's the gradient of f dot delta x delta y, and then this is the remainder. Let's finish the problem. We need to identify epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, and then show that they satisfy the necessary limit. Sorry, this down here should have been epsilon 2. Here's the expression for delta z that we left off with. I'm going to add to this plus 0 delta y. If we go back to the expression for the remainder that we were looking for, we wanted to have some sort of coefficients dotted with delta x delta y. So looking at this expression, you can probably immediately see what epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are going to be, but let me write it as the dot product just to make it look like the notation I gave you. So this remainder expression here can be written as delta x comma 0 dotted with delta x delta y. Now it matches the form of the expression for differentiability that we saw before. So delta x is epsilon 1 itself and 0 is epsilon 2. As we let our change in input shrink to 0, so as we let delta x delta y go to 0, 0, do epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 approach 0? Well, for epsilon 2, yes, it's obvious. Let's check for epsilon 1. We want to take the limit. As delta x delta y goes to 0, 0 of epsilon 1, but that's just delta x. There's nothing tricky about this limit. Delta x is going to 0. Delta y doesn't make an appearance here. So as delta x goes to 0, delta x goes to 0. I'll write out the second one just to be complete. For epsilon 2, the question is, does the limit as delta x delta y goes to 0, 0 of 0 go to 0? And the answer is yes, because it's 0 already. So we've reached the same conclusion as before. Once again, this function f is differentiable at the point negative 1, 2. I hope this demonstration helped you see how to use that second description. Let's conclude today with some useful theorems. The first one is a result that you probably saw in single variable calculus, and that is if f is differentiable at a point, then f is continuous at that point. In other words, differentiability is a harder property for a function to have than continuity. You can be continuous, but not differentiable. However, if you're differentiable, then you must be continuous. 
The logical contrapositive may be more useful here when we're investigating differentiability of functions, and that is, if f is not continuous at a, then f is not differentiable at a. So if somebody hands you a function and says, hey, is this function differentiable at a? And you look at the function and you say, wait a second, that function's not even continuous at a? Then you're done. There's nothing left to show. You've already proven that it's not differentiable. Again, a word of caution here with functions of multiple variables, and that is that the gradient of f may exist, meaning that you can write down something that looks like a linearization even if the function is not continuous. So it is not enough to be able to write down an equation that looks like it should be a tangent plane that doesn't prove differentiability. However, if you compute the partial derivatives of f, in other words, you compute the components of the gradient of f, and they exist and are continuous on a nice neighborhood around the point in question, which could actually be the entire domain. So if you have nice continuous partial derivatives, then your function is differentiable. So the existence of partial derivatives is not enough. That's my warning here. But if the partial derivatives exist and are continuous, that is enough. Then f is in fact differentiable. We can revisit the function that we've been working with in this lecture, f of x and y is x squared plus 3y df dx is 2x, and df dy is 3. Those are the coordinates of the gradient. Both of those expressions are nice continuous functions, so this function is differentiable. In fact, you can look at that and extrapolate that this function would be differentiable on all of R2. We don't have to go point by point. OK, so that finishes this lecture on differentiability. The main heart of differentiability is to investigate whether or not a function has a good first order approximation. If we can take a hard nonlinear function and write down, say, that tangent plane approximation so that the tangent plane approximation well estimates values of the function near a given point, that's what it means to say that f is differentiable. Thank you for your attention.